I want to bring you a message today from uh, two verses in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Two verses that we've heard, probably most of us, uh, many times, over and over. Um, hope to look at this in uh, the scheme of God's plan and what, what God knew, what God had in store as we look at this today. Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6, where the Bible says this. It says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Let's pray. Father, we continue to praise you today to thank you for every gift that's good and perfect because all of those gifts come from you. Father, help us to understand your wisdom, who you are, what you are, is beyond our comprehension. May we see your plan for us as it's displayed through the life and the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. We ask that you grow your church we ask that you'll be glorified and pleased here with everything said and done here today. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. When I pull up these two verses from Isaiah 53, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. He bore the chastisement that we deserved. These verses, many times we've heard them, we've heard them so many times, so often, frequently with, with things like communion meditation, maybe we don't even, we don't think a lot about it. Everybody knows. Isaiah 53 verse 5 and 6 is talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, right? I mean, everybody knows that. Do you understand when Isaiah wrote that, when Isaiah recorded these words, crucifixion had never been invented yet. Do you realize that Isaiah died 700 years before Jesus was born? When you think about that and consider the question, what did Isaiah know? Did Isaiah even know what he was writing about? Because I suggest to you he didn't. And this is how I can say it. It's 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, that's the church, they searched, the prophets searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when He predicted, the Spirit of Christ predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. They tried to figure it out. They wanted to know. They were searching. But it was not revealed to them, or it was revealed to them they were not serving themselves. They were serving you, the church, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Peter tells us that the prophets, the prophets didn't know what was going to happen. The prophets didn't know when it was going to happen. Peter even goes on to say there, even angels long to look into these things. See, we've heard Isaiah 53, 5 and 6 so much, we... we Everybody knows it's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus. And you've got to understand at least that idea that Isaiah himself, he didn't have a clue. Now, let's consider something else. Now, the question, what did the demons know? Did the demons know who Jesus was? Because at times, Jesus, when he cast out demons in the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, they said, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So what did the demons know? Well, demons are a little scary for us because one, one thing, we can't see them. And you may think, hey man, I, I know I see some. Let me tell you. Well, we can't, see, we can't see demons. They're scary because they're stronger than we are. I get that from Luke's Gospel. Uh, Luke chapter 8, in, in this instance, says many times uh, demons had seized a man and there were more than one. His name was Legion. There were many demons. It says, though the man was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains... Can you break a chain? 
He broke in his chains and been driven by the demon into solitary places. And this demon was causing this man to live in a cemetery, and that's a unique place to go live, you know. So they're stronger than we are. They know more than we know. The Bible says, Acts 16, verse 16, in this instance, a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. When you read Acts 16, you know she was not a follower of Jesus, and Paul cast that demon out. So they, they're stronger than we are. They know more than we know. They can predict the future. Uh, we know they're against us. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So he's hunting us down. You've seen on the National Geographic show where uh, you've got a herd of gazelle that are crossing the, the stream or whatever. And you got a lion who's down in the savannah and he's just creeping along just ever so slightly like an overgrown house cat. Ah! Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. He's hunting us down. Demons are scary for us. They know more than we do. They're stronger than we are. And they're hunting us down. And you've got to realize the demons have a lot of control. In fact, I suggest the, demon, the demons, the devil, controls this world. Preacher, why would you say that? Uh, well, it's in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. John says to the church, he says, We know we are children of God, and we know the whole world is under control of the evil one. Now, God obviously is in control of everything, but God gives the devil power and control here in this world. And that's what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. So the question I'm asking you is, what did the demons know? Have you ever noticed that in the temptation of Jesus, or not in the temptation rather, but in the, uh, uh, in the betrayal of Jesus, have you noticed how Satan was directly involved? The Bible says in John chapter 13, verse 27, and this is at the Last Supper, it says, Judas, as soon as he took some bread, who entered into him? Satan. Now I mentioned in Luke 8, there were many demons. His name was Legion because there were many. And we know Beelzebub was known to be a prince of the demons. At least that was a title for, for a prince of demons. We know there were many demons, there were multiple demons, but in John chapter 13, Satan himself enters into Judas who betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You see that it was such an important task that Satan would not send another demon to do it. Satan went and did the deed himself. You see that, right? So the question I'm asking you is what did the demons know? When we read Isaiah 53, we say he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we're healed. And we automatically think everybody knows that's talking about the crucifixion, but we've seen that Isaiah most likely didn't know. What did the demons know? The Bible just tells us in Luke 23, verse 32, when they got Jesus to the designated place, it was on a hillside, it was outside of Jerusalem. It was a place that they called the place of the skull or Golgotha. It's most popularly, most popularly it's known as uh, Calvary. But it had three names. And when they got to the place, it says there, the place of the skull, there they crucified him. And at that moment, They've had Jesus betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. He's been handed over into their possession in the middle of the night. They've run him through a trial. They've actually blindfolded him and punched him with their fist. They spit upon him. They humiliated him in every way that they could think of. They handed him over to the Romans and begged for his life. And the Romans eventually... They said, we'll punish him or scourge him and then release him. So they beat him mercilessly. He's bleeding. He's cut. Uh, open wounds every which way. They lead him out of the city. The Via Della Rosa, the, the path that he traveled is not the shortest distance. It's the busiest. And when they lead him out of Jerusalem, crucify him most likely naked, humiliated in every way possible, and nail him to a tree. That's where we're at. There they crucified him. 
And my question is, what did the demons know? You understand that the angel Gabriel, Gabriel had spoken the word from God. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, it says, All angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Hebrews 1 verse 14. Gabriel was a ministering servant. He's an angel. He appears in Luke 1. He says this. He says this to Mary. He says, The Lord God will give this child because Gabriel told her, you've never known a man, but the Holy Spirit of God will come upon you, and the Holy One, you will conceive a child. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And you understand, all the Jewish people, practically without exception, even the disciples, expected and were looking for an earthly kingdom. Do you understand that the devil himself, the devil at Calvary thought he was winning? The envy, the jealousy, the spite, the hatred, the punching, the evil behavior, the spit in his face, the humiliation of the Holy One of God, the devil thought he was winning. When the Bible says in Luke 23, there they crucified him, do you see the devil is thinking? He wins! It's a victory dance! And I know that's the gospel truth. How do you know that? It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8, where the Bible says, the Holy Spirit says, None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, if the devil had known, he was sealing his own fate. And he didn't have a clue. If the rulers of this age had known what they were doing, if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Do you know what that means? That means that Calvary Jesus, God Almighty, through Jesus, is displaying His unlimited power. At Calvary, where all the world was convinced Jesus was defeated and the devil himself was convinced that the plans of God were thwarted through Jesus' death at Calvary, it was in fact God's greatest victory. And the Holy Spirit says, you can say amen, praise the Lord. In Colossians chapter 2, the Bible tells us that. Verse 15, the Holy Spirit says, having disarmed the powers and authorities, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. God was displaying His power, His wisdom, His might in the face of all that the devil had set out to thwart His plans and to tempt Jesus and to convince Jesus to sin and to worship Him and bow down Him and turn this stone into a bread and throw yourself from the temple and every, everything the devil could throw at Him. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was sinless. But of all the evil that surrounded Jesus to betray Him and beg for His life and have Him murdered, crucify Him! Even to the last minute, the devil thought he was winning. And in fact, God was making a public spectacle triumphing over evil, triumphing over the devil, triumphing over everything that's contrary to the will and purpose of God. He brought about victory. When we think of Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6, we think it's everybody knows He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. Everybody knows that's about the crucifixion of Jesus. The prophet had no clue. 
The devil had no clue. And in fact, the world is still full of people today who refuse to believe the truth of the matter. Can you see here the providence of God? When I say providence of God, in part that means wisdom of God and the purpose of God. James and Peter, Peter and John rather, Peter and John prayed it in Acts 4. Notice what they said about the crucifixion of Jesus. They said, God, they did what your power and will decided beforehand should happen. God, we know they crucified Jesus, but you decided it should happen. The providence of God. Hear what the Bible says. In Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, it says, Jesus is the Lamb that was slain from the creation or the foundation of the world. You know what that means? That means while Adam and Eve were running around in their birthday suits in the Garden of Eden, God had a plan. The Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. So we've got to now consider the question. If I ask you, I say, who crucified Jesus? And you might say to me, you might say, well, the, the Romans did it. I mean, they drove the nails, true. And you might say to me, the Jews, the Jews asked for it. They begged for the life of Jesus. True, the Jews did it. The Romans did it. Pilate did it. He gave the order. True, true, true. You might even say to me, well, we did it. But only in the most indirect sense. I mean, I didn't drive any nails. I didn't beg for his life. Of course, he did die for my sin. Who crucified Jesus? Can you see what the Bible's telling us about the wisdom and foreknowledge and the providence of God? You want to know who crucified Jesus? It's in Isaiah 53. Verse 10 where the Bible says, It was the Lord's will. It was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. The Lord. God Almighty makes his life a guilt offering. Who crucified Jesus? God did it. And He did it because He loves us. And the Bible tells us in, in 1 Corinthians 1, because this is all the message, just the message of the cross, the wisdom of God. And the Bible says, since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached. To save those who believe. And in that same chapter, three verses prior, the Bible tells us this. It says, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And all these years later, I'm still, I'm still preaching what's being preached around the world today. It's the cross of Jesus. Our sins, before any of us were born, our sins were paid for. The debt for our sins was paid for through the sacrifice of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, at Calvary. And He overcame sin, He conquered the grave, and He's alive today at the right hand of God. You see, He's in control. Overall, with no exception, He's in total control with total authority and total power. And the Bible says about us, it says we know in all things God works together for the good of those that love Him who have been called according to His purpose. God has a plan. And I don't know what you're going through today. I, I don't know who's about to lose his or her job. And I don't know whose stocks are plummeting and none of us know what North Korea is going to do. And I don't know, I don't know about the, the uncertainty of which you live and kids going to school and who's going to make it this week. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know God's in control. And I know Him who had a plan before the world began is the one who's on the throne today. And I know in Christ I'm His child. Through the power of forgiveness is found in the blood of Jesus Christ and obedience to His words. 
We're serving God Almighty. We exist for His glory. All things work together for good. And even though it seems like we're defeated and we're downcast and we're downtrodden and the world's winning, and it's better to be a little bit deceitful and to be a little bit greedy and get all you can, man, be rich and be wealthy and be powerful and be affluent. It may seem like Christian people are losing. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. It may seem like the devil's winning. It may seem like you lose. It may seem just as one-sided as it did when they had Jesus nailed to the tree. When the devil himself was doing the victory dance, God's plans were thwarted. What God wanted to do was not accomplished. The devil super uh, excelled and was successful. He prevailed. So it seemed for about six hours that Friday. God has a plan. And God's in control and His plans are not thwarted. And the preaching of the cross is still powerful and God still saves through the blood of Jesus. And the invitation is still open. Whosoever will, let him come. And it's presented one more time here today. Forgiveness is found in obedience of the Word of God and to the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing if you believe what you've heard. If you're willing to confess with your tongues that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, if you're willing to repent of your sins, quit doing it your way, do it God's way then you're ready to die. You die with Christ by being buried into Christ. As Paul says in Romans 6, all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death. Water can't save anybody. But obedience to the Word of God will save your soul. Maybe you need to rededicate your life. If you have any decision, if you just want us to pray with you, pray for you, any decision, won't you come as we all stand?